We are continuing to speak about technologies, technologies that are transforming agriculture sector. And moving from blockchain to alternative proteins, today we're going to speak about digital technologies in general. Because we're living in the fourth industrial revolution, then big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and many other terms and definitions that you came across are also applicable in agriculture and food sector. Today, my guest is David Chandra, who is responsible for APEC Microsoft Technology Center. Their team worked closely with the key enterprise customers to help them through their digital transformation journey by providing tailored engagement from strategy briefings and visioning workshop through rapid prototyping. David has extensive background in government industry and has worked on various projects in financial services. He was the lead author of an application integration white paper and co-inventor on patented tool and methodology to analyze and evaluate software system architecture. David, thank you very much for accepting our offer and joining us today. Thank you for the time and the opportunity. So my very first question is about, you know, everyone associating Microsoft with a, like a tech giant that invests in hardware, software solutions, but it seems that agriculture is also of interest of the Microsoft. Can you speak about why Microsoft is interested in agriculture and what are the projects that you're doing at the moment? So as a company, uh, we do have a research arm and one of the researcher that had a passion with his background in the farming growing up in India. So he actually went deeper into trying to take advantage of the cloud technology, some of the wireless technology that we were developing a few years ago, and also the miniaturization going towards IoT and how AI can actually be pushed towards the edge. So that resulted in a project called FarmBeats. And today it's actually in public preview that's available in Azure. So a lot of what he's gathered around taking advantage of satellite imagery and applying AI and artificial intelligence to be able to analyze that through some of the capabilities our partners are developing, that's all being pulled together because as a company, we are a platform provider and we work closely with additional partners that are more specialized in particular fields. So agriculture, farming is definitely one of the key areas that's important. On a bigger picture as a company also, we are very invested in making sure that we contribute back into the global environment, right? So we align with the UN um, global initi initiative. And if you saw the announcement more recently about us going green in the technology and going carbon neutral, so a lot of these are very positive things. I feel as a, comp uh, as a person who's been working with Microsoft, I feel really good because I feel like we are contributing back to the community and to the society and to Earth in general, right? not causing additional issues or adding to the problems that we see. You've mentioned FarmBits, and I think FarmBits has become one of the very popular platform for all the companies that are providing machine learning or AI solutions in agriculture. Could you provide more information? What is FarmBits and how startups or companies that are interested to benefit of the FarmBits platform shall do how to access that platform? Yeah. So let me, uh, so as a platform, we have a lot of fundamental building blocks that startups and companies can actually take advantage of the bat. Um, let me start a little bit from there and then I'll get a little bit more into FarmBits itself. Um, if you look at one of the big push since Satya comes in and when we're starting to transition a lot more aggressively towards cloud, one of the big theme is about democratizing AI, right? Because if you look at farming, one of the challenge is, A, how do we get the sensors, how do we get the telemetry from the field coming back? But once you get that, what do you do with all of this information? That's where the AI can come in and really, really help. So I think from a startup perspective, we have the platform. One of the interesting thing that the Farm Beats initiative took was essentially in two folds, which personally to me, it resonates practicality and real life, right? So one was, there was a lot of assets that's around, but it's kind of like you have building blocks, but no one has taken it together and kind of designed something and assembling and merging it together. And that's kind of where the innovation comes in. Um, one of the key things that, um, our researcher did was essentially, as I mentioned before, take some of the development that we've done in IoT and 
put that into the field, take advantage of the census that's coming, becoming available. And also there was something that we did that was very interesting that the governments were stepping into because when you look at rural area, Wi-Fi internet connection usually is a problem. And without a block of network connectivity, it's very difficult to be able to have the sensors and the data coming in. So we use, we had a technology where we leveraged TV white space. So what that means is, you know, in television, there's a block of spectrum that is allocated by the government that is for TV, but not all of this spectrum is used. Um, they're long range, so they don't transfer as high data rate as a Wi-Fi, but they can go very long range, so they're very practical. And the good thing is the spectrum's already allocated, so it's a matter of knowing in which country, which area, which spectrum are free, and then taking advantage of that. The resulting um, interesting thing is you can actually develop almost like a router that goes long range, so it can get all the sensors into a semi-local environment, and then you process the information on edge, and then you can either pump it up into a central cloud, or you can do other things with this, right? Um, the other thing that our researchers did was they're very conscious on costs. Because as we all know, the farming, especially the one that will benefit the most, are likely going to be rural area. They may not be as familiar with technology, and technology access is usually not the easiest, right? This is um, even more so in the developing country, but also in developed country, like in the US, you see that a lot of this benefit and the work is actually benefiting the farmers there. Because they are also facing similar issues where they need to increase yield, and they can't get any more land, so they need to increase productivity, and this is one way that we can do it. So basically, precision agriculture, digital farming, as we call it, is, is a technology that can help farmers to increase productivity, optimize cost, and therefore increase efficiency, but also sustainability, right, because of the optimization of the inputs. That means that we need to promote this technology, in particular in developing countries, where farmers are facing those challenges. In your opinion, what are the difficulties in terms of the transfer of the technology? Because obviously you mentioned United States. Yeah. And in the US, we're speaking about larger farms that have the economies of scale, and it's easier for them to integrate those kind of technologies. And at integration level, the cost of integration is relatively small. In other words, yeah. they have the payback period is pretty short. When we speak about small farming in developing countries, the issues are much different. So have you thought about what would be the right channel of transferring technologies to developing countries and especially to the smallholder farmers? I think <clears throat> um, definitely working with the government agency will be critical because a lot of the developing countries, um, they have a number of other issues, right? They, if you think about it, um, they would worry about the basic day-to-day -day farming just by itself. Um, and likely they will have challenges potentially in leveraging technology because some of the key things that we did observe and we did help out with, if you look at farming, it's not just about the precision agriculture-based ecosystem. How do you uplift the farmers in when they're selling the crop and can you get them the optimal price by giving them access to an open market where the price is actually the real price versus a middle person's marked up price and then taking a big cut in the middle. Um, so if you look at all of that, the technology plays a key role. And in that particular area, the, the, the government definitely plays a lot of um, role, and so is NGOs coming in. And if you look at the way these farmers have increased productivity in the more traditional sense is through better seeds. Again, these are coming through the NGOs. So I think those are the partnerships that we definitely need to look into because the key is to make sure that they can use the technology um, at an affordable level but it also gives them an immediate advantage without requiring a lot of knowledge, right? So the more that we can aggregate a number of these small farmers and kind of distribute and cover an area, um, that would probably help a lot. So if you look at some of the things that we did in the farm beats, you can actually plot in the satellite imagery a particular area so that you can have an analysis. It doesn't really mean, it, it doesn't know, right, whether this is, belongs to 10 farms or it's one farm. So it can actually, you get economies of scales from that angle. And what you can put in there is number of sensors, and you can actually suggest the number of sensors that you can come in. So at a very high level in places like India, where we've actually helped some of the small farmers, um, basic areas like 
we put the sensors on the ground to get real-time updates of what the weather information is, what the soil moisture content is, and also combining that with some of the historical and also predictive satellite imagery and also weather forecasting, they can really help the farm prepare in terms of preparing for crop yield, when is the best time to put fertilizers, because you don't want to be putting fertilizers when it's at the wrong time. Either it's going to get washed away or it's not enough water and then it probably won't get used immediately. So those are the optimization that we can definitely help them. Again, all of this will help them a lot and it's a lot more than um, because it helps reduce waste, it optimizes the crop and then waste as in fertilizer, which is not necessarily the, the best thing to waste because if they get drained out, then it, it, it's not being used by the plant. In other words, in order to have that transfer of technologies to developing countries, you have to have the private sector, public sector, NGOs, kind of investing into the technology in the first place, because basically you have that uh, hardware and software solutions, and then find the way that there would be a middleman that would facilitate the, the kind of a relationship with the smallholder farmers. Because in comparison to other previous, I would say, generation of technologies, probably precision agriculture and digital farming would require some kind of a skill set by farmers and therefore that middleman would be uh, would be a kind of a the middleman would be that one that provides that facilitates that exchange of information in this respect my next question would be what are the criteria in terms of basically we're speaking about the, the first kind of a phase is the sources of data that mm -hmm. could be satellite sensors iot and others other equipment then we have some kind of a capacities for machine learning and artificial intelligence that basically analyzing the data. And then on the farm level, whether it's machinery or whether it's human, they basically analyze the information and according to that information, do their farming. So I'd like to speak about the first basically mm -hmm. component, the data collection. What is the criteria of the high quality data? One of the key, uh, one of the important thing for the data is real time data from the ground itself, right? So I think the benefit of having the cloud services I mentioned before, the satellite imagery, the weather forecasts, and kind of vegetative analysis from the image that you get, that's actually available online. So that's pretty accessible. But if you look at the next key component is making sure that there is monitoring like the soil level, moisture, et cetera, because this will give a real time feedback loop to make sure that what we're seeing and what's happening on the ground is actually real. To have those sensors in place, you would need the sensors, but you also need the network backbone, right? And you would need a consolidator to be able to consolidate the data and do some lips, at least in the initial level of analysis. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot of information coming out. And again, it's very difficult to understand what it is. A lot of the power of precision farming is not just from a single sensor, it's the combination of these different data that will really help a farmer, right? Because we, we want to get to essentially, is, especially if they're managing a block or a bigger block of land, there are other things that's impacting the farm, for example, the slope. So they may be irrigating not optimally. So some area might be getting better irrigation, better fertilizing, and then another area is not as optimal. So these are the kind of things that if we can help them detect this, and we can say, hey, looks like this crop is growing at a slower rate, or it's actually even dying, which is worse, then they can do something about it potentially to fix it. And that's kind of the area that we can help reduce wastage. The tricky balance, I think it's going to be, and part of the reason why it has to be a partnership in deploying this technology, you, there's so many technologies today. I think the trick is how do we get it at the right cost level that it would make sense for the return of investment, right? And how do we ramp it up so that it doesn't inundate them with a lot of Additional information, yes, it will be nice, but it's not probably crucial for phase one to really help them get that biggest bang for the buck. Okay, that's interesting perspective. Uh, other than precision agriculture, obviously have that direct impact on the farming. But like when we look at the how e-commerce, for example, been mm. developing in China and other result of the e-commerce, we see a lot new I would say, instruments available on the market, for example, and FinTech, which provides a lot of financial solutions mm. by collecting the data through the uh, 
for, for the track of the consumer. So my question would be, can we think about some, I would say, secondary products are the result of the application of the precision agriculture? For example, can precision agriculture at the end of the day make financial resources more accessible and cheaper, affordable for the farmers? Or are those, do you think that there is any parallel between these examples? Um, definitely think there's a lot of potential opportunities for innovation. Right? If you look at the trend in agriculture in general, and um, I personally have a little bit of a hobby in this, there is a trend in the bigger cities to have um, localized farming. Because if you look at the whole ecosystem of a farm, there's a lot of wastage in transporting the produce to the consumer. Right? If you think about the, yes, there's a mass uh, scale, uh, economies of scale, but at the same time, there's a lot of wastage. It's, it's, it's kind of like because it's a mass industry, you get the, the, you get the scale to get the cost down, but at the same time, you waste a lot in between. One potential future could be you become specialist farmers or farmers on demand almost, right? Because if they kind of understand and know what type of crops are coming in or what type of demand is coming from the end consumer, they can probably start segregating their farm into smaller batches instead of one big batch. And then once they start tailoring, then um, one other big thing is traceability. So imagine if you can actually order your orange from a farm with a specific kind of breed, and you know it's belong to that particular farm, there's an, a sense of ownership potentially that you can probably take advantage of, right? As a farmer, you have more direct relationships. So you optimize the whole ecosystem. Similarly, there is probably a potential for things to move closer to where the consumer actually spending. So you have a very small farm. In Singapore here, we don't have a lot of land. So we started to do hydroponics, which makes a lot of sense. And that's an area that I think it's important for a country like Singapore because food security is not just about the supply chain, but it's actually what happens if the country is shut off? Can we produce our own food? Yes, self-sufficiency seems to be a very important issue. And I think government of Singapore has been paying a lot of attention having the 30 by 30 strategy and investing a lot in urban agriculture, vertical farming solution, but also creating an interesting ecosystem for, say, alternative protein solutions. Last time we've been talking with a very interesting colleague speaking about how those technologies transform the food sector as well. Uh, my next question would be actually uh, to sum up the previous question mm -hmm. is that you've mentioned that basically the precision agriculture is, create, is scaling into a more global food value chain optimization because we know the demand, we know the production side, and at the end of the day, the technology would, would really optimize this relationship. Uh, having that in mind, what is, the, what is the next step with the precision agriculture? Because a lot of people are speaking about autonomous farming. Mm. And obviously, it's actually, it's not, a, um, it's not something which is basically a technology that we have it at the moment, right? Yep. But it's most probably it's very expensive and it's yes. applicable for the larger farms. Uh, what, it, what do you think? Is this technology going to be more affordable and will have more scale to autonomous farming? Or is it something that will be basically a luxury product for larger farms? It's, it's a tricky question because um, if you look at the trend with all the technology, China does really well in bringing the cost down and scaling things up. So I think there is a potential down the road to make it more scalable and accessible. The challenges with farming is it's very different with different crops. So it's very hard to automate. If you know, um, I'll give you an example. So if you farm an apple tree, an apple farm or an orchard, you imagine, you know, the apples where they're lying, you know, you need to be able to have flexibility and being able to identify where the apple is and then being able to pick it, right? Or you get these big machines that just kind of like rotate and destroy some things along the way, but pick the apples up as well. <laughs> uh, it's not really fully automated, right? It's just machinery. Um, and then also in the, in the developing country, um, this has always been the challenge when I was coming with technology automation coming from the first world. They'll say, yeah, you can say productivity, but then the person will just say, that thing costs three times than what I, I can hire three people to solve that problem. Um, it's still not saving me money. <laughs> 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 right? So I think uh, it's a balance, right? Because yeah. in, in these countries, do you really want to automate everything at the cost of people not having jobs? 
or do you give people jobs but optimize the yield and maybe up the yield so that there is more profitability? Right? Because it's not just about efficiency, it's about quality. If you can get higher quality through precision farming at the detection and the optimization phase and not so much the automation, maybe that's good enough. That's an important question because a lot of people are speaking about the danger that technologies are going to replace farmers and we have more than 500 million farmers in the world. So what would be the kind of the fate of these farmers? And, and we're kind of speaking about the balance between technological agriculture and maybe really helping farmers to become a more farm managers based on the analytics rather than farmers that are engaged in a lot of uh, labor intensive works. What is your perspective on that issue that you've mentioned actually in the previous answer about the future of farmers? Who is the future of farmer in your opinion? Because it's pretty inspiring to see that at least with the precision farming and we're working with several startups, you see a lot of young people are really interested with an yep. in agriculture. But previously we associated agriculture in particular in some developing countries, it's usually a more elderly population engaged in agriculture. Do you think that we have the transformation of ag sector? Um, I think we do. Um, and I actually think the farming phenomenon is going to split into two distinct areas. So one is the staples. So the things that you need to produce in mass scale just because it's part of the diet that people need to fulfill their daily, daily sustenance. But I don't know if you've noticed the trend in the food. There's a lot more connoisseurs, right? So you kind of like have the staple, then you have the very high end that will go and find the weirdest thing or the most secluded thing just to get that experience. So I actually think that's where agriculture is going to go. And that's where the technology can really diverge in a lot of ways. So one is about precision at the mass scale and being able to optimize. And I think to some degree in the more first world country, um, that's where automation will make a lot of sense because it will yield higher crops, but also um, allows them to pick and yield the crops at a lower labor cost. Um, but at the same time, you got to remember there's another part of agriculture that um, computing has been impacting for a while, which is around optimizing the seeds, the plant itself, right? Because a lot of the analysis on the DNA and the, the, that level, the biological level, a lot of that is driven by AI and machine learning in the back end as well, cloud computing. Uh, but at the other extreme, I think more common urban farmer, I think it's going to come up, but it's probably going to produce higher yield products. So there's an opportunity there to have a customized, very precise for specific maybe types of crops or um, more smaller crops or very specific types of crops that can yield higher margins, right? essentially, because it's just unique. Um, so I think that's probably the area. I'm not sure whether that's kind of <laughs> yes, answering. Yes, that's a really interesting kind of an angle to look at the issue. Uh, you used, and myself also, used this ML and AI interchangeably. But obviously, when most of the people speaking about precision agriculture, digital farming, they usually re refer to the machine learning yeah. more than AI. What would be the application or example of AI in precision agriculture, if there is any example? Um, I think it's probably interchangeable at the moment because a lot of the examples, like even if you look at the map analysis of the vegetation, a lot of these are machine learning. Right? The artificial intelligence from a sense that over the learning, it knows how to apply or understand um, what that information is giving it. Um, one of the tricky things, and I think we're sorting through the machine learning, is how do we crack open the black box? Because um, unfortunately, some of the side effects of the deep learning, machine learning, there's a lot of, it becomes a black box because you don't really know what the system is actually going to yield at the output, at the understanding. It's almost like you are teaching like a human, right? Yeah. You, you, it has its own opinion. It has its own way of thinking after a while. So you give it an input and you kind of look at what its output is and then try and figure out backwards what it is. So that's the other part that's important about what we do in Microsoft as well. We are trying to make AI a lot more transparent because it's a problem when you don't really know why they come up with a certain output, right? It's not so much um, the how we kind of know, but the why and being able to kind of understand and whether you can course correct because some of these adjustments will become very important. Not so much in the farming, but in the other application of AI where ethics can, can come in place. And that's 
ethical AI is one of the big area topic that we are also looking at in there. Actually, you spoke about ethics, and I think that brings me to the next question about the data privacy. Because, you know, when we speak to many governments in developing countries, obviously we discuss what would be the preconditions for application of the precision agriculture on scale. And of course, the first issue that they raise is that availability of the digital infrastructure yeah. as a precondition. And when we discuss that particular issue, usually people refer that who is going to be the owner of the data generated by the precision agriculture technology. What is your take about data privacy in ACT? Are there any challenges that we need to regulate? What government needs to know and needs to do about that? Um, it's, it's a very hotly debated topic. Um, I think it depends on the context where the how hot it is being debated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Farming is probably one area that uh, it's probably not as high in the scale just because a lot of the information is more about agriculture. It is important, but it's not as sensitive as, for example, personal private information and other sens more sensitive information regarding an individual. Generally, uh, we are a believer of making sure that if you are owner of the data, even though you placed it into the Microsoft Cloud, for example, we have mechanisms to make sure that it is well protected and we are we are complying with things like GDPR, so that um, traceability of the data, who access it, all that in all that goodness around um, regulatory aspects is taken care of. We also have abilities now in the way things are computed in the cloud, where you can actually not just make sure that the information is encrypted when it's uh, at rest, but it also imagine when you're actually processing it. Right in the processor in live memory, because normally what would happen is if you don't encrypt this, if someone, some reason have access, they can actually see what you're doing. So the way this new technology works is everything is encrypted. So even if they have access to that, it's, it's still encrypted. Even the processor is doing processing, it's encrypted, which is amazing yeah. new tech, right? Um, so if the, if the information is that sensitive, there, is, there are abilities now that can help protect that. But to go back to your initial um, premise about who owns the data. It's literally, we believe that whoever generates the data, in this case, if it's a government or if it's an individual, they should own the data and they should know how to take care of it. Some data would make sense for them to want to share, but if they want to keep it private, then the infrastructure is in place to make sure that they have that ability to do that. Yeah, so basically, whoever owns data, they have the decision whether share the data for any good reason or not sharing it at all. Sorry. and using for their own needs. That's a very important point. And yeah. I think our audience was basically when we have that discussion, usually the governments and country offices, UNDP country offices raising that issues. My very last question about, everyone is so excited about FarmBase platform and the work that Microsoft has been doing in the field. And I'm sure uh, many colleagues at the UNDP country offices would be interested. Okay, is there any potential cooperation that they can build with a Microsoft on the precision agriculture. What is the way that Microsoft FarmBeats works with the governments or say uh, cooperate with an international development organization? Is there any mode that they need to know? Or are you still kind of a, have your plan of kind of a designing uh, your intervention plan in the world? Um, we're, we're very open. So in Asia Pacific, if you know, um, I run the Microsoft Technology Center. Um, our aim is if there is a need from a government to look into more of Palm Beach, for example, we're more than happy to have a strategy session so they understand what the technology is and then an envisioning potentially to figure out, hey, is this applicable? What part of it is applicable and how, what model are you looking at right? to, to kind of impact your farmers in general or your constituents? Um, so we're definitely very open to that. And I know the engineering team has been very open in working. So Again, the example is in the US that we're working with the farmers. We have implementation with farmers in New Zealand and we've had implementations in India. Right? So it's definitely a very open environment. As a company, it's very hard because it's not, um, we have a service that's available, but it's not a, a very easy or traditional go to market. Yeah. <laughs> if you think about it, right? Because it has, to, it's, as we go back to our earlier discussion, I don't think it's enough just for Microsoft to say, hey, I want to push farm beats into a country if the country is not ready, right? And the country means the government and the actual farmers because we do need to be able to have leverage in the government to be able to reach those farmers because they're not a natural 
audience for a company like us. And now I have to ask my very last question in this case. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is the role of education in, in, in adopting this kind of a technologies, and particularly ag education? Do you think universities should really look forward in terms of the integrated into their curriculum, into their teaching, the precision agriculture, creating and uh, such labs where students can spend time and learn the technology and then help to transform uh, transfer that technology to the field. And do you think that Microsoft will be interested in the future to cooperate also with an ag universities in developing countries to help to design such programs? Um, so I think to your first question, definitely super critical, right? Because that's probably one way to inject excitement into the new younger generation coming in. Hey, agriculture is not just about rolling up your sleeve, going yeah. into the dirt, right? If you look at the different aspects, there's a lot of things to do. Like you can design the device, the sensors, the mechanisms, the automation. At the other end, as I mentioned before, if you look at the countries where they have progressed quite a bit, like in Malaysia, where they've made good progress in seeds, in developing the seeds to have better yields, a lot of these are using technology. Right? because you can't develop it without technology. So I think that area is very important. In terms of working with the education um, colleges, universities, it's something that Microsoft has always been involved in. So it's definitely something that we definitely open to do. Thank you, David. Thank you for sharing your insights and also kind of sharing more information how to work with Microsoft on precision agriculture and digital farming. That's all for today. We, I think it was a very interesting and fascinating conversation. We spoke about what is digital farming and precision agriculture and how to use these technologies. What is the channels of delivering the technologies to developing countries? And what is the role of the government, international organizations and educational facilities? I hope after this episode, you'll be able to go ahead and start thinking about how to transform agriculture with a digital technologies. Thank you.